In this episode, we present another model of the game of framing and reframing. It's the 3P model, policy, principles, personality. In general, a politician can explain a standpoint from three perspectives. This is the first one. We want to increase small business tax deductions by 5%. And this is number two. We want to increase small business tax deductions by 5% because entrepreneurs generate new economic activity, introduce innovations, they create jobs for dozens, sometimes hundreds of people, they work very hard and they often take personal risks. Perspective number three. We want to increase small business tax deductions by 5% because we need to support the entrepreneur. I come from a family of entrepreneurs and I know how hard my parents used to work. And I saw how difficult it was for them when things didn't go so well for a couple of years. And I can still remember how proud they were when things picked up again and they were able to expand the business. In the first scene, the politician outlines her policy, the first B. In the second scene, she says something about her own principles or values, the second P. And in the third scene, she adopts a more personal approach, the third P. A politician who only talks about policy is simply providing information. Information is often cold and cool and analytical. In addition, most politicians submit dozens of new policy proposals every year, creating an information overload that we simply cannot process. However, although they submit dozens of policy proposals, most politicians' views are based on just a few values, a few principles. When the politician in the video talks about her values, things begin to warm up, at least for people who are interested in entrepreneurship. Once we know what her values are, we are better able to understand her standpoint. It makes sense that entrepreneurs should pay less tax because they drive economic progress and innovation. The same goes for the third P, personality. Telling people that you come from a family of entrepreneurs adds a personal dimension to the policy. People who value entrepreneurship will identify with the politician. When you personalize a policy proposal, it goes from being a cool issue to a warm issue. In summary, when someone communicates about a policy, they are simply conveying information. But when someone refers to principles or values or something personal, they are entering into a relationship with the audience. The first lesson of this episode is therefore to make sure that you're always able to link your policies to your principles and your personal experience. This model can also be used in the game of framing and reframing. The rules of this game are very simple. When an opponent puts forward a frame based on one of the three P's, you can reframe the debate by using one of the other P's. Here's an example of the three P model in action. Suppose a government wants to cut funding for university studies like history, philosophy and the social sciences. This is what a philosophy professor might say. The government wants to cut funding for university studies in the fields of history, philosophy and the social sciences. This shows that it has a very limited understanding of the role of universities in society. Apparently all that matters is technology and economics. That is to say, knowledge that can be put to use immediately. Knowledge that cannot be put to use immediately is regarded as an unnecessary luxury. However, Historians and social scientists teach us about the context in which technology and economics function. Philosophers teach us critical thinking. We need to educate our students to become engaged citizens who ask critical questions about technology and the economy. That is the classic academic ideal. That is why we need universities. This is a war message. The professor refers to the values of critical thinking, of reflection, of engagement, academic values. 
Many people will agree with this. Actually, it's almost impossible not to agree with this view. There's indeed more than economics and technology. How can you reframe it? Well, you can use a frame based on one of the other piece. Have a look at this. Look, in this country, history students still outnumber physics students four to one. There are more people studying uh, philosophy than mathematics. For each chemistry student, we have 10 historians and two philosophers. And for each person studying mathematics, we have four people studying communications. So don't come to me with those kind of complaints. In this example, a frame based on principles and values has been reframed from a policy perspective. What effect does this have? Firstly, by not stepping into your opponent's value frame, you avoid getting stuck in a debate about the merits of history, philosophy and the social sciences. Secondly, and more importantly, our philosophy professor doesn't know what the facts are. He has a strong moral condemnation of the policy of the minister without knowing the facts. Suddenly, his original value frame becomes cheap rhetoric, starts to sound a bit hypocritical. We can also play the game of framing and reframing using the third P, personality. Here are a couple of examples. To start with, you can make policy personal. A famous example of this involves Bill Clinton. In 1992, Clinton was confronted by an activist who criticized his administration's AIDS policy. Instead of explaining the policy, Clinton responded by saying, I feel your pain. He turned a question about policy into a personal issue. He made it relational. In a similar way, you can turn a question about principles into a personal issue. For instance, many people champion admirable principles, but their personal lifestyle may not reflect or may even contradict those principles. It is also possible to reframe a policy frame using principles or values. Here is a policy frame. We are in favor of reducing unemployment benefits. If we cut them by 5%, we create a strong financial incentive. At present, these incentives are too weak. If you step into this policy frame, you will get stuck in a technical discussion about financial incentives. This might be a more effective way of reframing the debate. What sort of view do you have on human nature? Do you really believe that people prefer to sit at home without work because the incentives aren't good enough? You should go and talk to those people. You should find out what they have to say. These people, they're frustrated to be without work. They want to work. They don't like to sit at home unemployed. They, they, they want to work, it's their life. It gives them dignity. And they want to be among people again. They want to work, it has nothing to do with your financial incentives. What effect does this have? The first politician is clearly in her comfort zone as long as the discussion is about facts and figures. However, the question of the second politician is about principles and personal commitment to the unemployed. Because of this, the first politician's view of human nature appears to be that people are mainly motivated by financial incentives. Anyone can sense that this is not a very positive attitude to have towards other people, that she is no longer in her comfort zone. The second lesson of this episode is therefore to make sure you know how to play the 3P game. Ensure that your own messages for each of the three P's are in order, that you can explain not only what your policies are, but also what your underlying principles are and what your personal commitment is. If these three are in order, it will not be easy for your opponent to surprise you.